Good afternoon, guests. Um, welcome everyone to the level measurement of solids and the Anderson Hauser Difference Digital Event with Gerhard Jansen, our level expert from the application support team, and Francois Gagné, the product manager for level, temperature, and pressure from the marketing team. Um, uh, so a uh, little bit of housekeeping as I'd like to advise you that you can put your questions in the chat section and we will try our best to answer all of the questions during the session and what we don't get to we will follow up to you personally with an answer. Um, so what I'd like to do here is we're going to start this off with a question and I'm going, it will appear on your screen momentarily. There we go. Alrighty, I'll be closing up this poll in an another few moments. Okay, Francois, I will let you take it away. Thanks a lot. Gail, bonjour tout le monde, merci d'être là aujourd'hui. Thanks a lot for your time, for attending, much appreciated. Uh, we have some terrific content for you today, so let's get, let's get started. Um, as an introduction, I would like to say a few words about Andres Hauser the uh, the company we started in uh, in europe back in 1953 but uh, we've been doing business in canada for now 30 years actually this year is our 30th anniversary in in canada we have a yeah global presence um with our our network, you can buy Endress Hauser instruments, services, and solutions in, in just about every country in the world. We have 14,000 employees and, and growing. And an important figure here is the 7.5% uh, the of our income that we invest every year in re research and development. And we pride ourselves on leading the pack as far as technology goes, as far as adding values to our, our instruments. We're known for our high quality instruments, but we uh, that doesn't mean that we, we stop every year. We keep on, on, on building um, with research and development. And we have over 8,000 patents uh, to show for it. Yes, a, a global presence, um, a large scale company, but we still follow the guiding principle of our founder, George Andrus, first serve, then earn. That means we keep our employees happy and we, they in turn keep the customers happy, treated well, and then success will come. Simple enough, but not always easy to uphold. These people are our owners. We are a privately owned company uh, owned by three generations of the Endress family. You see Klaus Endress, uh, uh, our board president on the right. And I say generations, and it's an important term for us because as a 
family privately owned company uh, we think in terms of generations that's our time scale not next week not the next quarter but but generations the longer term and uh, this is particularly true or it's revealed in tougher times where even when there's a crisis or a difficult situation like the situation we're in now the focus is always on keeping our employees upholding the level the level of service and commitment to our, our customers first above you know making a good number for the end of the month the end of the of the quarter so it's um it's very important to the the company and very very real uh, and that uh, that investment in r d is shown and now segueing into our our topic for today and um it's it's showing in the progress of our radar line and with this i'm going to hand over to my colleague gerard jensen thanks francois um i hope gail that you have given me the permission now to move the slides so uh, this shows a little bit about uh, the evolution that happened with uh, instruments this is just showing the radar instruments and as uh, some of you know when we talk about radar it's not only one uh, um, instrument that we are talking about there is multiple frequencies so we started many years ago with six gigahertz and it came 26 now it's 80 and of course there is also guide wave radar that is used um, so uh, in total that is 113 uh, gigahertz um, of, of frequencies that we are using and today we are not going to talk about all of these we are going to talk about um, focus on radar uh, for solids and particularly the 80 gigahertz radar in this case any question about other things of course it is also welcome but the focus will really be on the 80 gigahertz radar for solids so there is a number of these radars we talk about the model numbers that are fmr67 in this case these are uh, german nomenclature that we are using in our model code and the 67 in this particular case are for solid applications they have different designs. Um, on this picture here, you can see now instrument that have a flange. They also have a purge connection. That I'm is sorry, the, sorry to interrupt you, Garrett. I don't think we see your screen. You don't see my screen? No. Why is it not showing my screen then? Can we? Uh, yes yeah. now you can see it yeah. okay okay so um i think the previous uh, screen you kind of saw well no not really that either but um okay so this just show the the offering that we have but as i mentioned we are focused Sorry, on Chance, we still can't see your screen you can't see my screen no so gerhard there you go yeah. show my screen Perfect. Can you see it now? We can see it now. Thank you. So if I now change the screen, now you see a change? Yeah, all good now. Okay, okay. So as I mentioned before, it, uh, we are talking mainly about level instruments um, for continuous measurement and in particular for solid applications. So that is, uh, as already said, there is some different versions of those. They have, some have air purge connections. Some of them have alignment options like this particular one. And there is also those that have um, thread connections or just the flames without the air purge connections, uh, which can be used in certain applications. But I'll come back a little bit more about that as we uh, progress through the presentation here. So when we talk about uh, radar, very often we are talking about beam angles. 
So a six gigahertz radar have a certain beam angle depending on the antenna size, a 26 degree, the six gigahertz radar have a different beam angles, and 80 gigahertz have of course the smallest beam angle. But what does it really mean? Yeah, first of all, we need to understand that beam angle is defined as within that angle is 50% of the emitted energy. But does it really matter? Yeah, of course, it learn, now we're looking at the footprint. So if I have a six gigahertz, I will have a larger footprint than if I have a 26 gigahertz. And if I have 80 gigahertz, I have an even smaller footprint. So it would then look like this. But still, is there something that is really important? It's really depending on applications. If you can see on this application here, I have a conical section in, in, a, in a silo or in a vessel. And if I really want to measure very far down into that conical section, I need in principle to have a very narrow beam. Otherwise, I will have too much of interference reflection from the walls. And now it's become then more and more important than to be able to have a smaller beam angle. Of course, this is also then depending on the available process connection. Because the bigger process connection that we have, the smaller the beam angle we can get. Okay. Um, but it's not only the beam angle that is of importance, there is also other influences. And we are talking about different kind of reflections, diffuse reflection and specular reflection. So that means now, in principle, what is the grain size of the product that we want to measure? And we are then looking at the wavelength and the frequency. So if I now have a lower frequency to get a, a diffused reflection, where I get the reflection from each particle, I need 50 millimeter or two inch diameter of that particle. If I have 26 gigahertz radar, I need half an inch of particle size. 80 gigahertz means four millimeter in diameter. But as you can see here on the side, we also have the radar pointing in a certain direction. And the question is always, is this a representative um, position to get an average level? And this really depending on the angle of repose, because if I have a steep angle and I'm very far out to the side, I might not really measure in the optimum position. And now it's coming into the um, ability to aim this in a particular direction. And therefore I have this option on some of those radar to have an aiming uh, device, an alignment option that I can tilt now the radar with up to 15 degree angle. Typically, the rule of thumb is that we try to aim this to the center of the outlet of that vessel. And if uh, now the product doesn't have a steep angle of repose, then it might not be necessary. And if you have certain solids that is more or less like flowing, where you don't really have an angle of repose at all, then of course it's not that important to be able to aim this beam in a certain direction. But still, if you have very powdery products and you have large angle of repose, it's really uh, recommended to use this alignment option. Okay. Um, Let's now see here if we talk about heartbeat. Um, now there was a slide here I kind of missed out on, but anyway. So um, a few things that we are going to talk about here um, and talk to the instrument. I will go into also some application later on, but heartbeat is something that you will hear a lot of us uh, in different presentations to talk about. And I will go to, through that, what does mean also on the level instruments. Commissioning wizard is a way, how can we make it easier for 
users to commission our instruments. And there will also be a very quick mention about Historam, Bluetooth, as you see the symbol about, and also SIL. So heartbeat, first of all, is something that if you have used any Anderson Hauser instrument, you can you have noticed that we offer that on many different instruments. And in that particular case, we always talk about three different parts of heartbeat. Heartbeat technology consists of heartbeat diagnostics, heartbeat verification, and heartbeat monitoring. The heartbeat diagnostics is built into all the instruments that have heartbeat. It continuously monitor the health of the device. If there is any kind of, of a problem with it, it will then come up as a message we use the Namur symbols to indicate what the problem would be. So typically you would like to see the green check mark. Everything is fine. If any one of the other come up, it will also show a, a, an additional code, kind of indicate what the problem can be. And for a level instrument, when we are talking about that, the, the instrument is going then to continuously monitor something like an 80 diagnostic measures and as you can see here on the side this is some of them so this is going through um, the instrument going through these continuously um, and you don't really have to do anything if any kind of problem occur it will then give that message whatever not if it's something that need to be um, uh, maintenance requirement or if it's an alarm all of this will then show up automatically. But there is also another option and that is heartbeat verification. And that's very com much come down to, if you want to make right now a verification, you want in principle to make sure that the instrument right now is working. Sometimes these are legal requirements, sometimes this is just regular maintenance requirements, someone will look at the instrument, they maybe make some notes, yes, they have, they know that it's working well. This is a way to automate this, that you actually can get a printed report. So in principle, this is a pass and fail report. It will look something like this. And in some cases, you also have limits. For instance, if you would look to uh, power supply that is uh, on the terminals, it will come up then limits from 14 to 32 volt. And then it come up a value that the instrument right now has. And that will then be printed in this report. And eventually you can then print this out and you can put the date on and name and signatures and so on and for your future references. So this is something that you will need to uh, decide, yes, I want to do this. Otherwise, the instrument is going us through the diagnostics. Next part of this is heartbeat monitoring. And this is particularly inter interesting when you talk about solids, because very often in solids, we experience buildups. And buildups is something that we can monitor. And why would we monitor this? Do not have anyone to run up on a regular basis to check out the instrument if there is build up or not, because build up will have an effect over time on the instrument. So this is then just to show a little bit about what we actually are looking to, because build up will happen on the, the instrument. In this case, it's a simulation at the factory, and they just show that you will have build up on the antenna itself. Now I need to go out of this presentation mode because otherwise you cannot see this animation. And I'll just show this. This is just an animation of how, um, how we purge uh, the antenna with compressed air. So this is how it would be then, how you connect then compressed air at the, at the sensor and then you would then be able to um, clean off the antenna as long as this is a, a powdery buildup. 
Okay. So build up. Um, we'll have an influence as mentioned on the performance of the radar. So if we then go to here. So what you see now is what we typically refer to as an envelope curve or it's actually re the reflection curve. So this part here is the process connection or where the antenna is. And then we are sending out energy through the air and it will hit a surface and we'll get the reflection from there. So the signal strength is of course depending on what the material is. Uh, and then as we go through this and then just get a little bit of build up, I will get a little bit weaker reflection from the product itself. But what is more interesting for us in this case is to monitor what is referred to the area of in coupling just because of of the buildup on the antenna that we see here, this part here start to change. If I have more buildup, I will of course have weaker reflection, but this area will also increase. Now it's mad, only a matter of putting up thresholds that is done in principle by default, and then we can then monitor if there is buildup and of course also get an idea of how much. If this is enough to really um, make the, the, make it necessary to clean it off, and of course in that case it, it's then depending on can it be cleaned by just uh, connect a, a purge air to it, or do we need to physically remove the instrument and clean it? But as I now have this tool, so I can actually monitor buildup. I don't need to have uh, someone on a regular basis climbing up and, and uh, disconnect the radar to clean this off. I can actually then look to this and I can have an output from the instrument. I can have an output that is a switch output. I can have a 4 to 20 milliampere output in additional to the regular one or I can also have it over the heart protocol. Of course, you will also have an indication on the display that if you have build up, but then you still need then to climb up to the top of the silo. So this make us um, an ability to, uh, to actually predict when maintenance is required for cleaning of the antenna due to build ups. So build-up is something that we monitor as mentioned. There's also other things that is monitored. For instance, the temperature inside the instrument, because too high temperature will, of course, reduce the life expectation of that instrument. Um, that is, as mentioned already before, there is foam detection, which is something similar to build-up, but we'll not go into that today because it's focused on solids. There is also other things like sometimes maybe, uh, maybe not even uh, think about it. Corrosion, not on the instrument, but on wiring. So the instrument uh, monitor continuously, what is the uh, voltage on the terminals? And if you have too much of a voltage drop, then you can actually then maybe draw the conclusion that there is some corrosion on terminals, but that is something that we at least can output if we actually are losing the voltage to the terminals over time. So all of this come down to one simple thing, safe process. We try to make it safer in whatever now means that we can. And of course, safety is not only build up on the antenna. Safety might mean something completely different as well. And we are then talking about then SIL, which is usually not so important in solid application, but still um, instruments today are typically developed during the developing process according to the IEC 61508. 
so they would then comply, like an ERADA would be an SIL2 instrument. As mentioned, this is not usually that important in, in solid application, but it's, it can still be important. Um, and when we then talk about testing, the, the proof testing can then be done through this um, heartbeat uh, feature, which will actually guide you through that um, proof test procedure that is written down for the instrument. There, starting with that you have to unlock the instrument to be able to go through it. And at the end, you need to lock it again so no one unauthorized are going in and tamper with the instrument. Histeron is, no, sorry, this, sorry, that now I was too quick. Commissioning wizard. So this is another thing that we, we see frequently, and especially now with me in the application support. Um, commission of instrument, this might not always be that simple as we think. So now we tried really to do this in a, in a very effective manner by having a step-by-step -step go through the necessary step that you need to be doing to commission the instrument. And it may sound, sound very easy, but for instance, if you have now a switch output or if you want to commission um, heart outputs, it, it might not be that very obvious where to go. So this is now built into this wizard. You are asked question all the time as you commission the instrument, starting with the tag number, the type of vessel that you have, uh, measuring ranges, and so on and so on. And at the end, then you come to the end of the commissioning where you then have documentation uh, created and so on. Talking then about Bluetooth, which is something that uh, we have uh, a lot of thoughts about. Uh, first of all, is it safe? And yes, it is. It's very, very safe. It will also offer you a lot of opportunities to be more self-sufficient. And no, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. So first of all, to use Bluetooth, you need to have the instrument enabled for Bluetooth. So that's an additional option. You need to have an iOS or an Android device where you can download our app SmartBlue. Actually, show you that. And as mentioned before, there is a lot of, or at least some concern all the time about safety. So what we have done in that case, we have went to um, an institute in Germany that is really focused on safety in terms of uh, Bluetooth technology. They are called Fraunhofer Institute. Um, and really make sure that this cannot be tampered with in any way. Bluetooth is of course limited to depending on line of sight, but typically 10 meters or 33 feet, um, you should be able to communicate with the device. It can be in non-hazardous areas or hazardous area, depending on the device that you use to commission it with. And in that case, if you now look to just an iPhone, uh, you will then see a live list where you connect to the device. There is a password. The initial password is the serial number of the device that you will need to have entered. And then with that information, you can also go in and get additional information about the instrument itself, which could then include then production year, uh, the complete model structure, uh, all the documentation, service information, uh, instruction manuals, and so on, and even spare parts. But that's under the operation app. If you then go into continue with the Bluetooth, where you do the commissioning, you would then have all the parameters that you need to uh, commission. You will have some explaining pictures. And, and help test, help test to uh, assist as well. And then 
uh, you go through the whole procedure again and then you have diagnostic and the status indication as well. So these are typically um, those things that most will look, look at. To me, in an application support, this is the most important part because this will allow us at Anderson Hauser to help you in a better way. There is an expression saying that a picture tells a thousand words. And this is really true here when it comes to reflection curves. So if I now have an, an iPhone, I can in principle record. Now I'm not sure how if this animation is working. No, it doesn't. Uh, so I can in principle record and save the recording of how the level is changing in a vessel with this reflection curve. And this can then be shared with maybe a more experienced technician at your site or with, for instance, our help desk. I cannot promise that we can help everything remotely, but at least it gives us a much, much better chance to understand what the problem is if we can see envelope curves. And as I mentioned, the only thing that is necessary is to have the instrument enabled for uh, Bluetooth and someone need an iPhone or an Android and download the smart app and we have all the, uh, the tools necessary. So this will make us uh, more able to help you much faster if you now can get these reflection curves provided to us. Because sometimes there is additional things that we need to kind of um, adjust, which is usually more in depth than what is really necessary to start with. And that is a, ma a matter of how we uh, determine uh, reflections in a vessel and these can look very differently depending on what is inside the vessel and to understand now if you should use short-term history and um, echo tracking long-term history and whatever now it is it's usually a lot more involved than most commissioning technician would like to go into but if i now have the envelope curves we can now better assist you with saying, okay, you need to do this change or this change. Okay, historon. So all these changes, whatever now it is, they are then stored in what we refer to a historon in the back of the housing of the instrument. So electronic is only for execution. So all the parameters, all the per specific on, on, on that particular instrument, the size of the antenna, whatever no frequency it is, all of that is stored in that so-called historon. And this is something that will then be always with the instrument. So if you need to change the electronic, it's just to put remove the old electronic, put in a new one, and it will automatically upload. So all of these things is just to make it easier for you to use our instrument. And then a few words on talking about applications. Hold on, Gary, sorry to interrupt. I think before we get into applications, yeah. we, have an, we have another poll. There you go. So we've shown you a series of uh, benefits of the Endress Hauser's offering, and we'd like to know, and you, I think you can select more than one or select the best one to you. What is the most important thing you see? And what would bring the most benefit to you? I'll we'll give you a few minutes or a couple of minutes. While we're doing that, uh, Gerard. Yeah. Uh, we had a question come up while people are voting. Maybe you could answer that. Uh, 
you are showing a purging a buildup. Yeah. And when we monitor the buildup, can we connect that to a PLC and automatically trigger the air purge when there's a certain level of buildup? Absolutely. We can uh, have a, a switch output on, on the instrument, additional switch output. It can be an additional 4 to 20 milliampere signal. And also, it could also be uh, made through uh, a heart protocol, where we actually will then, um, depending now, of course, if the system can uh, deal with heart inputs, then we can also assign a heart input to be the trigger for that event yes okay i see a couple more questions came yeah. in we'll get to the other questions at the end so maybe we can look at the at the poll results now i think most people have answered all right so we see heartbeat technology yes lots of value there but uh yeah i'm glad to see even still we uh you know, it's not widely used, but interesting to see some people uh, um, still consider it important. Yeah. All right, good, thank you. Thank you for participating. Okay, so then just uh, a few, um, to show a few application where um, instruments are used. Um, hold, hold on, we'll have to, uh, we're still seeing the poll maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, that will need to be. We we'll need to switch back to the presentation. While we're doing that, maybe we can do another question, Gerard. Yeah. Um, question here: What is the maximum uncertainty of the level measurement for FMR? Um, you know, if you if you measure against a completely flat surface, you could probably reach something like a couple of millimeters, like I think it's three millimeters that is specified. But unfortunately, with solid applications, you you usually don't have a flat surface, and by that it's then coming into angle of repose. Um, the size of particles, and this makes it more uh, challenging to uh, really define what accuracy, because in the end, you are looking to prof do a profile of a surface, and you only measure at one particular point. So how do you make a profile of a surface when you only measure to one particular point? So this this is always a, a discussion about how can how how accurate can you measure? And it's, it's very difficult to give a rule of thumb without actually having any idea of what the application is. But if I get some more application data, we can actually have a look into that and then we can try to figure out how accurate can we measure this. Okay, thank you. Uh, while we're uh, solving our poll that won't disappear issue. I will just quickly mention that uh, we have on December 1st, a very exciting digital event coming. Um, some very, uh, yeah, interesting presentations on new products coming up as we're reaching the end of the year and, and preparing to launch new and exciting products for next year. So you'll have presentations on that and other things about uh, um, our offering and how they solve uh, problems in different industries. So that's on December 1st. So you should, ex you will receive, or you should expect to receive an, an invitation, uh, if not today and before the end of the week, or you'll also be able to sign up from our, from our website for the December 1st digital event. And while I'm talking about the website, uh, andres.com, uh, make sure that if you are a, um, if you're a customer of, of Andres Hauser and you haven't done it already, make sure you create your andres.com account. A lot of very useful tools there. You can 
place an order, track your orders, uh, shop for spare parts. You'll have your you can have your pricing there. You have access to all the relevant documents, certificates, and so on and so forth um, on endress.com. So, and if you need more details, your your Andres Hauser representative can help you set that up and and walk you through the different uh, functions of of, of your endres.com accounts. So yeah. Oh, I think I'm going to become the present presenter. I've switched it back to Gerhard. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Thank you for your for your patience. Uh, but if I'm sure, as everybody, you've you've done a a lot of webinars, and you know that these things happen. But uh, that's good. I got to do uh, the two public announcements, so we're we're back in the presentation. So go ahead, Yard. Okay. So we can now see uh, uh, application examples for 80 gigahertz radars. Um, they become more and more common. Um, to go with 80 gigahertz radar. One of those things is, of course, um, very long measuring ranges uh, and also with a very small, um, I should say, narrow beam angles and also very good on measuring uh, powdery uh, products. So this is just an, an example showing uh, in uh, on a 138 feet tall silo. Uh, there was two inlets, there is a lot of buildups, and you will see that on the next slide, you can see here quite a bit of buildup. And in this case, we are monitoring this buildup. And even though that is kind of, of break off and then fall down, but still, they can monitor this buildup because that will actually have an influence on the signal strength here on from the surface itself. Uh, in that case, it might not be possible to do a purge connection, but it, it could maybe be that they they can do it or they have to take it off uh, if required and clean the antenna mechanically. This is just another very tall silo, uh, probably one of the tallest I have seen, uh, 295 feet tall. Um, I don't want to be the guy climbing on the top there because it will be like a, a full day exercise. Um, that is another one of coal dust. And as you see, this is our very often a powdery material, a lot of buildup you can expect. Coal is usually something that clings to everything. Um, so this is then that it, uh, typically that you would then use a radar with that kind of perch connection abilities. But not everything is uh, uh, with high frequency uh, instruments. Um, one of the limits that we have with high frequency is really, really high temperature. And the reason is that a lot of the uh, electronic is sitting just uh, in the neck between the housing and the process connection. And to separate high frequency technology is always a challenge. If you go lower frequency, we can typically do that in a better way. And by that, when it comes to very, very high temperature applications, yeah, first of all, we can mount the instrument further away, but it still might not be, um, it was a, uh, there will not be an ability to do that. And by that, we need to look at other applications. This is examples where they measure in uh, application up to a thousand degree. And what you see in this particular case is a piece of a hollow pipe and then there is a band and then the antenna is sitting down here. So the electronic that is typically the sensitive part is sitting far away from the very high temperature. And this would then be um, an application where we would need to do lower frequencies, not going into any more details about why we would use one over another, but this can be one of the reasons why we go in and use and lower frequency radar. But all of this is, of course, also depending on applications. Another example is uh, iron ore. The, the issue here is that the powder will have some metal particles, and with a higher frequency, metal particles will have a bigger impact 
uh, with higher frequencies than lower frequencies. And by that, we would then use a lower frequency radar. And I think this is the last slide that I have. So now, Francois, back to you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's the uh, the coming event in um, in December. I was talking about, and also, uh, if you go to our our website, you can have access. We have a really cool three D virtual booth, as we cannot do in person trade shows. Um, our marketing team in, in Europe created this amazing almost like virtual reality uh, booth where you can see different instruments, new products coming, and you can access that just by going on endress.com and in the uh, the images carousel in the, on the front page, you can just click on the virtual booth and you can see that. We have our event in December, and then, yeah, while you're on endress.com, look at uh, possibly creating your account if you haven't done so yet. Okay, we have a few questions here. Gerard, you ready? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Mr. Hamid Reza Eskandari, thank you for your questions and thank you all again for joining today and for your participation. It's uh, greatly appreciated. We uh, a good turnout today. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde. Uh, Gerard, what is the minimum measuring distance for the 80 gigahertz level transmitter? Uh, I'm not sure if I have a, a, a particular, it's also that, de really depending on um, the vessel itself. Um, we, can, we, we have seen applications where, where customers have put a radar onto a, a bottle of water um, and they measure the distance in, uh, to the water in that bottle. And that works perfectly fine if you have a bottle made of of plastic so you in that case you measure maybe a, have a couple of, of inches of measuring range if that would be a metal bottle instead you would never be able to do that because the energy is so um, high so it will just go back and forth between the ceiling of that bottle and to the liquid surface so it's really coming down to what is the what is the mesh? Uh, what's that? What is the uh, vessel made of? Mm -hmm. And also, what is the product itself? But typically, I have seen industrial. You typically would have maybe a couple of feet as the minimum measuring range. If you are talking about liquids, yeah. in solids, you are typically a lot longer measuring ranges. So you can actually measure very, very short measuring ranges with 80 gigahertz radar. And I see another question here, which is to be kind of related. What's the what's the blocking distance? How far away from the medium you have to be with, let's say, an FMR 67? Yeah, that, the radar, that is actually really not any blocking distance. That is, of course, a blocking distance in terms of if you have an antenna horn, that will create like a, a mechanical blocking distance. Uh, but otherwise, there's not really a blocking distance per se. Um, what we do, always have that in the instrument you typically have a blocking distance of typically something like eight inches and that is to prevent product to come up and touch the antenna itself but you can set that to zero there's no problem with that the only thing is the concern that if the you will have product to touch the um, antenna it could then cont contaminate and then create the buildup Okay, thank you for that. Couple more questions, and maybe you could turn on your your camera, Gerard, so we can see you ah. answering these questions. I turn mine back okay. on as we're okay. also ready, as we're <laughs> close to the end here to say goodbye. All right, there you go. Uh, all right, another very interesting question. It's uh, probably broader than the time we have for here, but what is the difference between, in general, measuring liquids and and solids? Uh, we saw that you might have to angle because it won't be like a, a flat surface. But are, what are other main differences between when you measure liquids and, and solids? Um, in, in, liquid, in, in, in liquids, liquids have um, 
um, both what is referred to as low dielectron constant liquids and high dielectron constant liquids. So if you, for instance, have water, you can always expect a much, much stronger reflection from it. Um, anything uh, from vessel walls will have a less impact because that creates some noise, but still you will have a very strong reflection. So the noise uh, ratio will be still um, a, a relative good. Um, if you have then, of course, you have things in a liquid application where you have maybe impellers. Um, it could also be different from what you have in a solid application, but otherwise it's also with the angle of repose, which you would have in solids. You don't really have it in liquids. You maybe have a turbulent surface, but then it's also come down very often to approvals. Because if I don't need to have an approval on a particular instrument, then why spend the money on that if I now have it designed for liquid applications? So therefore we actually have separate uh, the differences there. There is also internally that we amplify signals uh, slightly different. They will, a radar for liquid will most likely also work on solids and vice versa, but they are not really optimized. To me, this is like buying a, um, a sports car um, if you want to do um, off-road driving. Will it work? Yeah, to some degree, but it's not really optimized. So maybe that's kind of how I would reply to this. <laughs> okay. And uh, maybe one more question on radars. Um, how fast do the uh, sensors read? What's the, the response time? Then I guess would be another way to. Oh, how fast? Or uh, what are we talking about the the how how fast they are updating the output signal, or how fast the instrument is reading? I guess for the user, it's more they're more interested in the output signal. I would yeah, I would guess, but yeah. So so the output is something in like in the I think it's in the second um, in the second time. Um, even though that the instrument is reading a lot more, but it's a question of what will it actually provide you to get, because level application usually not change extremely fast. Yes, you can have it that you change the level bit maybe a, a few feet per, I wouldn't even say seconds, maybe a couple of inches per second, but usually not anything more. So I, to be on, really answer you, I would like to have a little bit more background information. What are we trying to achieve? Because it's a limitation of how how uh, often we are upgrading our um, 40 20 million per signal. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I want to quick. I think that's an interesting question we have here. Um, because we're today we're focusing on radar, but of course you have other things you can use to uh, to measure your level of, of solids. So someone is asking, uh, let me find a question so I have it exactly. Uh, what, how does uh, ultrasonic compare to radar? Maybe why would I use ultrasonic? Because it's because that's still something someone may want to use right for their to measure their solids. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and uh, and then of course we can we can right from the beginning see that an ultrasonic where we actually are sending out the sound wave and we use the same membrane to be the emitting energy as well as receiving energy, and that creates now a blocking distance. There's a physical, there's a blocking distance that we have to be concerned of, and that might be then a concern if you have the request to really fill the vessel up to the top and um, depending on the, now the measuring range as well um, in general dust will have a bigger impact on on uh, an ultrasonic even though that you can say uh, this the membrane will kind of have a self-cleaning by having the oscillation but the dust in the air that is typically more of a problem when when it comes to solid Another thing that can also be in effect in solid is a little bit of radar, sorry, ultrasonic in solids 
is noise and noise from for instance filling that can then interfere with the frequency that is used on that ultrasonic sensor but i think i mean in a lot of application still ultrasonic is a better alternative um, for instance if you have a conveyor belt and you want to measure the level on a conveyor belt an ultrasonic is typically a better option there because it's faster to react um, the yeah. same thing if you have a crusher um, and you crush stones an ultrasonic in that case is usually a better option than a free space radar um, and and i would usually say that if i have really large particles um or maybe like half an inch or bigger ultrasonic is very often a very very good alternative but of course there is always limitations and and features with the different uh, technologies okay there are more questions coming in but we're just about out of time uh, these questions will be saved collect correct me if i'm wrong gail and we have your your names there so we can uh reach right back to you with uh, with some answers on that we'll be happy we'll be happy to do that later uh we have one last question before we we let you go and this is more related to uh to your um, impressions of this webinar and we're preparing other ones and we're, we're we always you know want to improve so we'd like to know uh what you would like to see more of in next webinars, learn more about Andres and Hauser, learn more about measuring principles, technologies, learn more about our offering as ENH, or do you, would you like more applications? Um, so yeah, please uh, take a second to click and give us your feedback, much appreciated. I will give you all about another 30 seconds to uh, answer this poll and then I'll share it. And um, But before that, I'd like to thank you all for coming out today to listen to the webinar with Gerhard and Francois, our uh, level experts. And as I said, we'll. Uh, I'm going to close the poll. We'll make sure all questions are answered. Okay. I'll give you another few seconds and I will close it and post it. And there's the uh, shared answers. Okay. Some more applications on the principles okay all right good feedback thanks for that and yeah that's about our time maybe even one extra minute so thanks again thanks gerard gail all right From thank all you us. everyone presenters you. and attendees it was thank you very much for coming up to support us thank you thank you everyone bye, -bye. have a great afternoon Bye.